is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Hookshots Podcast. I am your host, Joe Cermelli, and you know what? It's uh, it's kind of like career day here on the Hookshots Podcast. Let me tell you what, you know? You guys remember, like, being a little kid when the, when, when the police officer came to school to talk to you guys about what he does? And that's that stupid kid... Adam Billman in your class kept asking if he was going to shoot his gun outside, right? That's, that's kind of like what, uh, what today is, you know, in a, uh, in a, in a grander sense, you know, I am a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of police work. I am a huge fan of cops, man. It's the original reality TV that there has been zero reason to change since its inception in the early nineties or whenever it was, every Monday night, damn it, Paramount Network, it is on all night long, and I watch it all night long, even though I barely watch TV, I watch some cops, man, and like, look, these, these like, other shows that try and run with the big dog, okay, live PD, okay, get, get that nonsense right out of my face, all right, the policing part might be real, but going back to the studio, for for color commentary like it's sports center come on you know i don't care what the anchor man thinks about decisions being made on the ground okay please do not cut away to a talking head right at the part where the suspect is about to say that the pants he's wearing are not actually his pants okay the pants were borrowed therefore logically he'd have no idea what's in the pockets because why would you be so audacious as to snoop around in the private property uh, in a pair of pants that you borrowed from someone else? Okay? If they keep crystal methamphetamine in their pockets, that is their business, officer. Anyway, look, hey, we got to keep it fishy, right? So obviously when I, when I say we're diving into law enforcement today, uh, you know, we're diving into uh, fish law. Maybe, maybe with a side of poached venison. We'll see. But, uh, you know, I'm talking about game wardens and conservation officers and rangers and stuff here. And I've tried to watch those shows, the Alaska Ranger, Warden, whatever, quote, reality shows. Uh, and I, I just can't get into them because um, it doesn't read like cops, man. I don't buy it all. A lot of it feels a bit too set up and a bit too staged. So I've never really gotten into those. But, you know, the thing that fascinates me... Uh, is not necessarily the fish or game crime that's been committed itself. I've I've always had my mind boggled by m- the motivation behind committing these infractions. Like, uh, let's say you're a drug addict, so you rob somebody for money to feed that addiction. Okay, that's that's really crappy. Like, that's not a good thing. But at least it's like an A and B, like cause and effect. Okay, like. Uh, Even though that's a a very poor motivation, there's like, you know, you're like, you're jonesing, man. Okay, so there there is some kind of motivation. But then looking at at fishing violations, right, like keeping too many fish or keeping undersized fish, I I have never been able to figure out the motivation behind that other than the vast majority of the time, it just being like simple greed. Okay, now we're going to be talking a lot about motivation with our special guest today, but... The, the way that I see it, there are very, 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 very few people in this country that need to kill fish or mammals to survive, okay? Like, we all like eating game. Like, I, I, I like a backstrap, man. We all like eating fresh fish, right? We're in love with the sport and the challenge that comes with it. But not very many people are going to starve to death without it, right? Yet I'd be willing to bet that on the fish front, at least, uh, a whole bunch of you guys listening have probably witnessed the taking of illegal fish, whether it be too many or undersized fish. I sure have. You know, I've been offshore and watched boats gaff every bluefin that came over the rail, even though at the time, you know, a boat could legally kill one. You know, I've seen people catch a short striper and whisk it away to their truck. And I also think that a lot of people sort of turn a blind eye or even in some cases, like, laugh this stuff off. Okay, now hear me out, right? Case in point, um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen those stupid memes 
and and gifts on social media about getting caught by game wardens. You know, there's like the Sanford and Son, you know, where he's like, you know, holding his heart. I'm coming, Elizabeth. And it's like how I feel when I see a game warden, you know. And then you've got the Forrest Gump where he's waving on the shrimp boat. That's like when the game warden is rolling up on your boat, but you know you're clean. You know, and then there's the, the gif of Johnny Depp in Pirates of the Caribbean Part 48 where he's like standing in the desert and, and runs away real quick. And it's like me when I see the game warden coming and I see people post this stuff. Right. And even though I'm assuming most of them are joking around, like I don't get the joke. Okay. Like, do you, do you want people to think that you're like a total shit bag when you fish? Like, is that funny to you? Is the idea of, of breaking the rules as a sportsman cute? Because it's not to me. Right, I take it very seriously because of my job. I have to. The simplest, dumbest violation, whether committed knowingly or mistakenly, could cost me my entire career. Right? If it got out that I was busted for a violation while fishing, I- I'd be ruined in this industry. And I've seen it happen. I won't name names. But not that long ago, uh, a-, a writer that worked for one of the two magazines I work for Um, he had to be fired and he was a respected contributor that we used often, you know, and he was very good and he was, uh, you know, a a very conservative sportsman and he made a simple mistake. And and as I recall it, he killed an elk, I believe on land that per his research, he, uh, could hunt and he was wrong. It was a simple, honest mistake that anyone could make, but he was charged with poaching. And we cannot associate with someone charged with poaching, regardless of the circumstances, even though it was in innocence, because you'll never explain to 4 million people on social media that it was an innocent mistake. So, yeah, I mean, I can honestly say I've never been put in a position where, you know, somebody wanted to keep extra fish or undersized fish. You know, my scenarios revolve more around, like, legality of location, you know, like... (laughs) I have some buddies, and I'm sure some of you do, that like catch sick fish, but they do it in places they ain't supposed to be. And they can spin it to me however they want to justify why it's okay, where they are, and how they skirt around it. But like, no way am I going, man. You know, not like, not a chance. You know, another big one is targeting stripers past the three mile line offshore. That's illegal for anyone who didn't know that. But if the bite is red hot four miles out, there will still be 200 boats out there. Okay? Many people, they just, they just don't care. And every GPS has it marked. You, you cannot, in this day and age, say you didn't know you were past the line. So when I'm out, I don't even like fishing close to the line, just in case. My eyes are glued to that screen. And if we cross it for five seconds, I will flip shit and get loud and demand that we go inshore. I don't care how good the bite is. Illegal is illegal. Even though the chances of getting caught are slim. And the reason for that is going to be a big part of our conversation today. Now, I do have a buddy, okay, quick shout out to AJ Matola, who also happens to be uh, a Hookshots fan, okay, who is currently a Pennsylvania conservation officer now, okay? We bump into each other time to time here on the river, and I'm shouting him out because I'm going to tell a story about him uh, later that's very funny and uh, very pertinent uh, regarding the first time I met him. But, you know, in, in doing a podcast about, you know, fish and game and, uh, you know, the law and order kind of deal, I, I really wanted to talk to somebody um, retired, you know, for several reasons. First of all, you know, you have somebody retired who's put in just a lot of years, you know, they've seen a lot more things. And also, frankly, you know, a retired guy is going to be able to say, uh, you know, a lot more uh, about the way it was um, than 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 the guys who are currently in the game. OK, there, there's red tape when you're talking to law enforcement. You know what I mean? Now, there are several different branches, right, of, of law enforcement that deal with, with fish and game. Uh, obviously, conservation officers, it varies state by state. You have fish and wildlife officers, but you also have park rangers. State park rangers are also tasked with, uh, you know, dealing with the fish and game side of things. And it just so happens that my dad has a good buddy all the way back from his college years named Ron Taglarino, who was a state ranger in New Jersey for 24 years. The first time I ever met Ron, okay, 
I was eight years old. It was the opening day of trout season, all right? And uh, he walked up to me in full uniform. I, I don't remember if he was wearing dark aviator sunglasses, but for effect, we're just going to say that he was. Um, and he asked to see my fishing license. And, of course, an eight-year-old doesn't need a fishing license. And I was so scared, uh, sure that I was, like, about to go to jail, that I cried. That was the first time that I met Ron Taglarino. And uh, we're going to discuss that in, 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 in much more detail here uh, in just a couple of minutes. Now, my old man tells me that he and Ron used to hang out at this joint called Jackie's in the old neighborhood back in the day. And with names like Taglarino and, and Samelli, doesn't it, doesn't it kind of sound like the beginnings of like a mob flick or, or something? It's like the opening of Goodfellas, you know? As long as I can remember, I wanted to be a fish cop. I know I'd go from rags to riches. But listen, I realize, okay, that, that, that Ron is just one guy that worked in one little part of the country, okay? But what he experienced in a, in a pretty long career, um, I'd have to say, you know, is going to mirror what the guy's doing this everywhere, working water beats, experience okay plus like this is new jersey so generally speaking we're like a you know like a little more assholey around here than the rest of the country you midwesterners that are so nice hold the door and uh smile all the time and you know not only can ron speak to uh the motivation and drive right behind breaking rules and and what can be done about it but also aspects of the job many of us probably don't even consider because i think uh, you know, as anglers, we have a tendency to view a CO or a ranger's full-time job as busting people for, like, short fish, when in reality, that is small potatoes compared to some of the stuff that they deal with. Breaking the law, 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 breaking the law. Hello. Mr. Taglarino. Yes. How are you, sir? Uh, all right. Yourself? <laughs> Good. You sure you're all right? You don't sound 100% all right. Oh, I'm out here working on my fishing stuff. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, what are you going fishing for? What what kind of stuff are you working on, man? Uh, ch- cleaning rods and reels and changing some line around and just thinking around. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to dink around sometimes, man. Well, we got fall fishing coming up, but uh, you just got back from Vegas, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, you know, left my money there. The lights got brighter. <laughs> Anything else happened in Vegas that uh, needed to stay in Vegas? Uh, only some things I saw that I don't even want to go into. <laughs> Well, we should we should have probably plenty of stuff to talk about today that you don't really want to go into, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make you. So, <laughs> well, I, I I had to look at my my contract I signed when I retired, so I wouldn't uh, you know had like 15 years not to talk about it. All them people are gone, so I don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so technically, you you had a contract from when you were arranging? No, 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 I'm only kidding. I'm only oh, kidding. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you already you already told me that the way I set up this podcast sounds like a Trump setup, and you're just going to claim fake news on everything that gets said. So, uh, I you know I I just wanted to claim that fake news in case it <laughs> got out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we we need to start this by talking about the uh, the first time that you and I met, which was a a very long time ago, back before that I even uh, I even knew that you were a friend of my dad's. When um, you you asked eight year old me on opening day of trout for my license, and I'm pretty sure I cried and thought I was going to jail. Well, yeah, not only that, I think you you, you tried to run away, but you know, <laughs> it was not on the canal, and it's a long straight run, and you know, <laughs> that is still often talked. And, and, <laughs> and of course, your grandfather and father were uh, you know had the best laugh of their life. Yeah, yeah, I was out with uh with dad and uh grandpa that day. And I I think yeah. I I think I had caught a crayfish or something and then you also asked me if it was legal size and I just I pretty much lost my shit and uh was was very scared. So it was a great, it was a terrific first introduction. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it was like 
we want to go home. We get this kid scared so he can go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that the real backstory? I had worn them out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the story was that they had enough already with you. <laughs> <laughs> ah, terrific. All right, that's good ammunition. I did not know that. But, uh, yeah. So to sort of dive into this this whole deal, so you were not a conservation officer in Jersey, right? You were a park ranger. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there were <clears throat> sim- similar uh, uh, work, but you know, I I concentrated on uh, at, at the time being assigned to like one park and uh, wor- work in other places like special duty and stuff. But um, you know, where a conservation officer had a county. You know, there was 20, 21 of them. Maybe a couple counties had had two because they were so big. <clears throat> so they had a county that they that worked, and uh, uh, though they could go anywhere in the state, also as I could. Uh, but I was assigned to a specific park. Gotcha, so, uh, gotcha. But I mean, you had you 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 were uh, you had a you had a sidearm and full power of arrest, right? You could throw people in the clink. Yeah, we 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 basically, in fact, we trained. To, we had to get our police training together, which uh, we did out of Seeger, trained by the state police. We had we had to go through. Uh, well, my my period, I had like twelve or fourteen weeks of training uh, down in Seeger by state police, and and also right alongside the conservation officer. So, you know, basically, when we when you're in a park, you're doing almost the same thing. They are in in the natural sense of laws, but we also were charged with uh, you know everything a regular police officer could do. So you know we could we could write you for driver's license and car inspections and you know anything. Uh, so we had full powers of arrest and full powers of any law in the state of New Jersey. Well, it just brings up a quick side question uh, because I'm thinking about it. Do police officers have the ability to enforce game and fish laws? Well, um, not really. They generally call in a conservation officer or uh, would call in us if, if they, you know, because the conservation or, like I said, one in a county, he may have been tied up. Um, they, they uh, I think they have some code, you know, like a municipal code right. that, they, that they can write under, but it doesn't, it's not like um, a fish and game statue. It doesn't carry the same weight, so... When you wanted to get somebody for you know some some costly offense, you wanted to write them under fishing game. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Same thing as same thing as me in parks. We had park regulations that said, "Hey, you know, if you if you were taking reptiles or you're caught an undersized fish, we had a minimal fine." And for fishing game, you know, you could you could be a little heavier on them, depending on how the people you know acted. And I, I got you. you I got you. I got you. So, how many years did you do this, Ron? How many years were you uh, an officer? Well, I uh, I actually did twenty four. I uh, had uh, I I left with twenty six years credit, but I got two for being in the military. So that that gave me twenty six as a as as a leaving thing. But I I really worked twenty four as a as a uh, state park ranger. Gotcha. What what year did you start? Uh, I started in September. I actually started Labor Day weekend of seventy three. Seventy three, and you were in the service. Were you in, were you in Vietnam? No, I I was. Uh, I ended up doing uh, state time, and then I ended up for, for a year in Germany. Gotcha. So I I was in the you know the era, but I didn't go to Vietnam. Gotcha, gotcha. So you know, I I imagine you were always a, a you know a lifelong hunter and fisherman. I mean, but you know, beyond that, was there any particular reason? Like, what made you want to get into that as a profession? Well, that's a good question, you know, because I had gone to school uh, after high school, '67, and I was I was taking up I was taking business courses. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it was my parents' wish they they thought well, you're going to make money in business, you know. So right, right. Uh, and I hated it, <laughs> and you know, I did. I, I went. I did Mercer County for two years, and then I went to a school up in Massachusetts, up in Boston, that was a. a a, a business college, and um, when I when I saw the working the working man, we would go to conventions as part of a class thing, you know, and right. and see see these guys, and they were thirty five years old. They looked eighty, <laughs> and, you know. It was it was at that at that time before what we have now, of course, with the with, with uh, the dot com world. It was 
dog eat dog. I mean, business, you know, everybody was trying to make a living and, and cutting each other out. So. Sure. Uh, I, I hated it, so I, uh, you know, I fooled around and started putting my mind down to stuff, and, and the Army got me because I, uh, I lost my college deferment. Gotcha. And so I, got, I was under the, uh, they instituted a draft, and I got caught up in that. And uh, actually, the service turned out to be the best thing because it kind of got me thinking. Right. And, and I ran into a fellow that was uh, trying to have me re-enlist in, um, in the Army, and I, you know, I wasn't going to make that a career. And I told him what I was thinking about, that I always liked the outdoors, and maybe I should think along those lines. And so he, he wanted me to go to, he had an inn at the University of Wyoming. And he said, I can get you in. He said, just, you know, let, we'll get your college uh, credits and see what they say. And so, yeah, I was accepted there, but I got married. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, things change. And I came home and I, I, I um, looked around, took tests, saw, you know, had the, the state booklet and county booklets and all that for, for jobs. Yeah. Uh, schooling was out of the question again, except at nights because I had to work. Now I'm married. And, right, and right. Uh, so this job came up. And along with about three uh, at the time, actually, was uh, I took a, a test for, for for this for state ranger, for a sheriff's officer, and for a uh, Lawrence Township police officer. Okay. And I was on the list for all of them and interviewed for all of them and, you know, thought about what I thought about. I wanted to work outdoors, so I took a shot with, with this, though. It was the lowest paying one at the time. <laughs> but... Uh, Turned out to be the best thing I ever did. Sure, sure. So yeah, I mean, you just mentioned you know Lawrence Township. That's that's where I grew up. My parents grew up, and you grew up. So you you probably shopped at my grandparents' bait and tackle shop. For anybody listening who doesn't know, my grandparents owned a bait and tackle shop uh, in Lawrenceville. They sold it when I was three, but uh, you were probably a frequenter of that store. Yeah, that was it. You know, I could ride my bicycle there, so uh, there was no else for me to go as a kid. That was the closest. So, right. uh, yeah, I was very friendly with your, your grandma and grandpa. Yeah, yeah. And your uncle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, there you go. We're like family, man. Uh, but, and you, you know, so, like, these days I know you do mostly saltwater fishing, uh, but, I mean, do, do you still freshwater fish around here much at all, or are you, you like the striper and fluke guy now? Well, I, you know, uh, once a year I might, somebody might, ask, you know, people ask me to go out with them and show them some things that have never done anything in a river. So I'm going to say once a year, <laughs> you know, right, right. I up on somebody's boat. It could be for shad, could be for for stripers, it could be for smallmouth. But you know, that's the extent of it uh, anymore. I mean, it's not. You know, I, I fish the heyday of the river. I think the river is is long past its heyday right now. Oh, oh it may yeah. Come back. <laughs> Don't get me started on that because that's a whole other podcast. Like I just fished right. it this weekend and. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty piss poor, but uh, yeah, yeah, I imagine see you know seeing some of these fisheries like anywhere really, guys who have been around fishing it for a long time, you see it change, and it's it's a little harder to get excited about certain things. Oh yeah, I I yeah, I was a river rat, you know. From I mean, as a river rat, I'm talking when I could drive. I mean, I could get down there as a kid, but from the time that I could drive until I don't know early forties, I was on the river constantly with with some friends. I mean, oh just all night fishing for bass you know and sure and uh but but you know that like anything else there's been some problems i guess with fisheries and they're just not there anymore and and maybe i'm a little too impatient you know? <laughs> <laughs> i hear that well so we're, we're talking about the delaware river here which is my home water too and that was part of your beat right tell me a little bit about like um you know as a ranger which parks you worked and sort of which bodies of water coincided with them yeah, well, I started actually in North Jersey. In order to get the job, I took a I took a job in a, in a state park called Ringwood, which okay. was up on the New York border in Passaic County. So, a lot of water, a lot of lakey water up there. So I was uh, parts of land was around um, Greenwood Lake, and uh, big big impoundments now that 
uh, they allow fishing, and they didn't at those days. They were they were owned by water companies in the, in the state. I, I, I was going to ask, yeah. So a lot of that water up in that part of Jersey is is Newark watershed, and uh, like you said, they've opened some now, but a lot of them were historically closed off. But I bet that didn't stop uh, certain people, did it? No, there's. I mean, it wouldn't have stopped me if I wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't in the job I was in. There were, you know, there were there were some secret lakes up there with some beautiful trout in them that you know you couldn't get to because you know it was Newark watershed, their property fenced in, uh, guarded, and you know just some great fishing there. Um, but when the water may have stayed with them, but the land went to the state somehow. They worked that deal out. Right. So then, uh, you know, a lot of them got opened up, and 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 there, you know, some great fishing for guys that got in there. Sure. But yeah, the illegal guys. Yeah, there's there's always people doing stuff like that. Yeah, I, I still I still know some that are sneaking around up there, and like I get yeah. invited, and I'm like, no, man, I can't. No way. Like I can't. I can't. I would. I I can't risk that. Like that's crazy. You know, for a couple smallmouth. But hey, you know. Um, so that's actually that's interesting because. I think people think of Jersey as as so crowded and you know full of oil refineries and highways, and not that it's not, uh, but you know that's only certain places. And then you know up where you are at Ringwood, it's it's a lot more wild and and woodsy up there and and mountainous, I guess, than than most people probably yeah. realize. Yeah, I mean, I I was always on uh, you know I was always on calls for bears and 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 mountain lions and. And, uh, you know, and you go, Jersey? You know, but, yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 and I, I saw them all up there at one time or another, and I was only there for six months. Right. So, uh, so you know, I did my time up there, and, and, and uh, uh, actually, I, I, I couldn't make the – I was commuting from here. Right, so, right. It's a long drive. Yeah, so I did, have a, I did have a bachelor's quarters on the park up there where I could stay overnight, so if I had a shift for three or four days, I'd stay overnight and come home. But that was a drag. So uh, so Washington Crossing opened up, which is you know our neighbor. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, so I took that and worked that for uh, seven years. Right. At, right. At, at Washington Crossing, which also was right along the Delaware River. So the Delaware became beside me fishing it. Uh, in the 20s and 30s, I worked alongside of it. Right, right. Well, just to sort of set up that area for people who aren't familiar with it. So, you know, Ron's talking about Washington Crossing State Park, which is supposedly where Washington crossed the Delaware in the famous photo. But you, you have the Delaware River there, and then uh, we have uh, a canal, the Delaware Raritan Canal, that runs alongside the river all the way to New Brunswick. And as you mentioned before, when you were trying to chase me along the canal, it's just like one straight line that only bends in three places. It's this very sort of monotone body of water. But correct me if I'm wrong, it's like the most heavily stocked body of water for trout in Mercer County. Like, that's a big deal for opening day because they just stock the shit out of that canal, right? Well, yeah, not only Mercer, but, um, you know, a hundred. Right. So it starts. It starts in it starts in Hunterdon and uh, you know runs down to Mercer and then makes the bend in Trenton and then uh, up to Somerset and out into the out into the Raritan River. Right. So yeah, so they stock from the you know the uh, Bulls Island, uh, which was my base later when I moved from the crossing to the canal and did sixteen years on that canal, uh, that park. So uh, yeah, so. Trout, I can't tell you how many trout went in that place. It was it was insane. Right. It actually probably had more fish put in it than let's say the Raritan. When when when, but it was much longer, of course, sections of uh, being stocked. But um, sure, like anything else, it was a, a slow moving piece of water. So there were sharpies there, you know that 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 found underground streams or inlets that came into it in places that you and I would wouldn't even know about because you know it, under the road and through the trees and all of a sudden it would dump into the canal and, and i can't tell you uh how many trout you could pull out of them spots where just that little flow would come in well well sure and i, and I don't want to get off all, you know like off on a tangent about the canal but you know again it's just this straight deep slow moving body of water and it's always frustrated me right because there's like 
no particularly visible, good, different structure, yet there are so many guys around here that religiously fish that canal for trout that you're right. They they know a little something, that something that's slightly different in this 20 feet of the canal versus the entire rest of it. And if you know what you're doing, it's almost like there's an art to fishing just the canal. It's Because you can't yeah. read it the way that you can, you know, a trout stream or something. But – it all it all brings up an interesting thing. Like I know this happens in a lot of states, but I mean New Jersey is pretty notorious for like this opening day of trout season rush. Some people, some states don't have a, an official opening day. Some do, and I, I have to imagine that that back in the day when you were working, I mean there there had to be some uh, that had to be like a a, a, a fun or maybe frustrating day for you guys just with the amount of people out there? Was that a dreaded day or like a we're going to have fun today kind of day? Well, it was both. You know, <laughs> getting it started, getting it started was like, uh, you know, and but then as the day went on, you know, you'd, 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 you'd deal with the people that fell in. <laughs> you, you know, you'd, you'd deal with the people that would uh, 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 tell on their neighbor that maybe caught a few extra. He shouldn't. Because they didn't fit, they didn't catch as many as he did, ah. you know. Uh, yeah, the, the the usual stuff. But I used to always uh, work first day and start them off at Bulls Island, and uh, you know I even stood on top as you cross onto the island. It was my, the, probably the most heavily heaviest fish place on the canal, right? Uh, where the water came through under the bridge and through the little uh, tubes. Sure. So. There's a lot of white. You've seen it, so there's a lot of white water there, and 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 there's 200 people there. Right, right. You know, and and so they and I stood on top with my patrol vehicle, and I would you know just hit the siren at eight o'clock. Yeah, and, yeah. I was uh, gonna say, yeah. So people, so people get it. Like, not only is there an opening day, it doesn't start at midnight. Like, you can't cast a line till eight a.m. So correct. you hit the siren, or a lot of guys, you know, the rangers hit the horn. But there's always like those dudes who are watching their watch, and like I, it's like oh. that, like that alone, like the first cast is like yeah. a thing in and of itself. It's it's, it's a religion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I I you know met so many people through through my job, but you know I I knew guys that had let's say lived in Trenton, uh, young men. Now they're seventy years old, you know, and. They moved up into the wilds of Hunterdon County, right? Uh, just just to be away from it all, and and you know they they couldn't wait for a first day of trout season, so, right? Right. A lot a lot of interesting, you know, the, the way people felt about it, you know. And I looked at it, I said, you know, it's a ditch, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know? exactly. But, you no, know, but uh, yeah. So uh, it was it was always exciting. For most people, for me, it was just to uh, you know to see the the massive tangles up as they all cast that one. <laughs> well, I I know I know you've got some some interesting and 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 uh, juicy you know specific stories that that we're going to talk about here. But before we get into that, I'm just curious. Like generally speaking, you know what what would you say is like the most not not necessarily tied to opening day, but just in general, like what's the most common infraction? On, on the fish front that you had to deal with? Well, um, it, you know, it's two. It's either undersized if, if it's not trout. Well, now trout has a size limit. Right. Right. I believe they do. They have a, uh, don't they have a nine? I'm not sure. I think, I, I, think it it's, I think it's eight inches, I think. Eight inches. When I, when I fished, there was no size limit, but, you know, you didn't keep them anyhow that small. But, so you had a size limit, which turned into the, you know, the canal also is, uh, has a lot of bass. Right, uh, and and in different spots, there's there's the, the population seems to be small. You know, there's some nice bass in there, but they're small bass, and so that that was a, a problem. Um, uh, size and possession, the amount uh, when it came to trout fishing, uh, well, it was I, yeah, the well, too big. Right, right. Well, of course, but I, I mean, I think you know, I think what it intrigues a lot of people and, and intrigues me is like. When you hear that there, you know, was a bust for poaching stripers in Maryland or wherever, I mean, this stuff pops up in news feeds all the time. Um, you know, I think that if you fish enough, I mean, I've certainly witnessed people doing stuff they're not supposed to, or you know that they're keeping undersized fish. And 
Like my my burning question is always like, explain to me why you're doing this. You you know that you're not supposed to be doing this. Why? Like why are you? You know so. Like what? What was the most common excuse? I mean, did they just lie and say, "Oh, I had no idea," or was there like sort of a governing excuse behind these, you know, keeping too many or, or going undersized that you would hear on the regular? Well, I think the I think the biggest reason is, and because nobody ever felt they'd get caught. <laughs> because yeah. if the, you know, you know the situation, you have a limited amount of of of, of officers that can work this. So, you know, your chances of being checked by somebody on any given day are, you know, pretty low. <laughs> right. You know, right. when you're talking to one conservation officer for a county and maybe you're fishing near a state park and you have, you, you had rangers, uh, still, it was just like, well, I can get away with this. And I, you know, I don't know, to explain a person's makeup why they want to take 20 fish as compared to six, which you're allowed. Uh, or, you know, keep your six and keep fishing and let them go. Right. But but, but to keep them, you know, uh, some people uh, used them. Most people gave them away. Right. You know. Right. Like, so why do you, why do you run the risk of, of doing that? And, you know, there was never a really good answer other than the fact that I never expected to see anybody. Yeah, so I mean, people would would just straight up say that to you, like, "Oh, I just didn't think that I was going to get busted." Yes, yeah, that's it. They, I mean, you know, they're they're like, they knew, you know, most of the people do that. I know their chances that you know they they understand who's out there. Sure, uh, and, you I know, mean, and that that translates across all fisheries. I mean, you know, you even hear it now, like, um, you know, you'll hear somebody at at the beach here say, "Oh, you know." The officers were, you know, checking boats coming into the inlet for short fluke, and it's like, man, that's that's really great to hear that they're out there busting people for for short flounder and stuff like that. But they're doing that today, you know. They're not going to be doing right. that the next day, the next day, the next week. So, I mean, you know, I, I think that's a concern that that sort of spans all states or most states. You know, is that you guys are out there doing your thing, but there's only so many of you. You can only be in so many places. And, I mean, I, I have friends who, like, live to catch somebody doing something wrong so that they can call the rangers or a conservation officer. But then how often does that translate to showing up? I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know, which begs the question then, you know, is it worth you doing that? I mean, how how many – Seriously, like unanswered calls came through you just because you were doing something else, or or nobody could get there. I mean, that has to happen fairly regularly. Yeah, it, 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 frequently because, especially my, you know, my job. If if they couldn't get a, a conservation officer and they get directed to us, um, you know, I, we were a jack of all trades. I mean, I I did I did career days. I did I did everything. Right. You know, nature nature walks. If, if 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 a school asked to come out and wanted to walk along the, tri- the 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 towpath and have somebody walk with the kids and explain some things, well, that was that was part of my job. Sure. So, you know, and 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 that's another thing. It was so hard to to change what you're doing in a moment's notice. You know, I'm with I'm with fourth graders, fifth graders, and then all of a sudden something serious comes down, and I have to leave that. You know, and you have to change your mindset that quick that it's sure it was, you know, and it, and it was tough to get to, like you said, yes, these calls. Yeah, it was like, you know, I'll take the information and we'll process it from there. Right. Well, here's a question for you. Right. I mean, in, in this line of work, um, do you have to physically see the infraction to be able to act upon it? And I'll give you an example. Right. Like um, not that long ago. I, I, I was pulling my boat out of the river here in the evening, and there's a dude in the middle of the river with a gigantic cast net, right, throwing a cast net out in the river. Now, right. I I know that that's legal. You, you can't throw a cast net in, in the Delaware River, at least from the PA side. I don't know what the Jersey rules are. But, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, if I call this in right now, if somebody were to show up, which, okay, now it's 9 o'clock at night, so so – nobody's probably showing up anyway but even if you could 
do you need to see him throwing that or is my word good enough? You know what I mean? If, if I say I see this guy, he's, he's catching a, you know, a bunch of smallmouth, you know, banging him on the head and throwing him back dead in the river. If you don't see the dead fish, I mean, can you still act upon it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's like, it's like, you know, uh, you, if you, you charge a person, you go to court and, and of course you're the state's witness. Gotcha. Um, so you, know, you, you you might wrap yourself up in it if, if that's the case. Yeah. Well, you know, I I my my thing is I'm you know you're telling me this you want you know we're going to press charges against this guy but you know you're my witness so you're coming to court now if you back out you know, there's nothing I got right you know? so, so yeah if people are willing to stand up and and st- and, and and say what they saw you know then then the case is made um, but. Like most, what you're talking about, most of cases are like that. It, it comes, you know, hunting especially comes from your buddy right. <laughs> or, or your wife, right. you know, that that's mad at you and calls Fish and Game and said, hey, you know, my husband did this and did that. And and that's how they make most of their cases. So they, they have a little more leeway like Fish and Game guys. They can actually go into the house and check freezers. Right, um, right. Where I do that. Right, uh, they, right. They they can you know, they get this information from a from a neighbor, from a friend, from a wife. So so yeah, I mean, any any infraction that's out there, it's hard for you know, it'd be hard for me to charge the guy and go on hearsay, right? Because they're going to get a lawyer, sure. and and that's all he's going to say is it's hearsay. So once you produce, you know, you come to court with me and say, hey, you know, it was nine oh two, and I'm pulling in, and this guy's just doing this and doing that, well. Now it's your word against it, his or right. hers, and you know the judge. Right, right, yeah, and so, I, I mean, I, I understand there's a lot of sort of red tape and details wrapped up, but I, I mean, I just think about that stuff. You know, if I see somebody catch an undersized striper and put it in a bucket and take it home, and then I, I don't know, get a plate number, whatever. I mean, if the fish is eight, if it's gone by the time anything happens. And, like, I didn't personally measure it. I'm just eyeballing it and saying there's no way that's a keeper. I mean, the the right. amount of times those calls have to even get to court have to be fairly low, right? Yeah, but they may lead to an investigation where if he's done it once, he'll do it again. So, right. you know, so that that's how most of it goes now. You know, you, somebody calls in and say, hey, these guys are, you know, I know two times this week they've been taking uh, 15 illegal stripers. Right, so you know they're going next week, so you get out there, right? And 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 then you personally see it yourself. Well, then then you have what you have, and then you have what they've told you. So right, uh, it's a stronger case. So so what I'm uh, driving at though is like when when people see it, call it in. Like don't don't pass it off and say, well, shit, they're not going to do anything anyway, so I'm not even going to bother. I mean, just reporting it is is. You should do that. Yeah. That's pretty damn necessary. Yeah, per, yeah, certainly because you know so, somebody's going to get around to it eventually. You know, uh, it, it, people may say, uh, you know, like you said, what good's it going to do? Nobody's coming. Well, like I said, they may not get there tonight, but they may get there three weeks from now, and these people will do it until they get caught. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, when when they get caught, like in your opinion, or maybe from what you've seen, I, I mean. You know, I, I look at these news stories about guys getting busted for poaching, and it's thousands of dollars in fines, and they're they're taking away their fishing license and all this stuff. Um, you know, it, to me, I always wonder, you know, if a guy's um, a big enough dick to do it in the first place, is he going to pay those fines? Is he going to show up in court? And is any of that stuff really going to stop him from fishing? You know, I, do, do these these fines and things? Um, do you think they work? I mean, how, how many times have you have you if ever, have you busted the same people over and over again for the same stuff? Well, again, like I'll tell you, right, I said before, it's very, very hard that, that uh, you're going to get caught, first of all, because of the manpower. So, yeah, do people do it? Sure. I, you know, I've been told that people that, that don't have driver's license to drive a car for their whole life. Because sure. They don't drive, right? So fishing, yeah, there's people that are going to do it. But, yeah, I, I, I ran into a few cases, and you know what? They're the people that get hit the second time, and then, you know, they lose something for five years. But I always thought along the lines of, besides putting the fine on them, that, say, they were boat fishing, they lose their boat. 
because they were using a boat while they were doing this. Right. Right? So so they lose their property and, and, and whatever whatever they were the crime they were committing. If it was a gun, they lose the gun, fishing poles, they lose the boat. And believe me, that would be a deterrent for a lot yeah. of people. Yeah, I yeah, I mean that yeah, having yeah, you're right. I mean having the threat of your boat getting hitched up to a, a ranger's truck and pulled away on the spot uh would probably turn a lot more people off. Yeah, and and they have, you know, they we we have used their rules for for illegal dumping in parks. We had such, you know, parks became a dumping grounds. People came in middle of the night you know, dump things. And, and I'm not talking just household furniture. I'm talking about construction sites that paid guys to haul stuff away. And, you know, they would drive down to, let's say, Wharton State Forest, you know, you know what Wharton's like. Yeah. It's vast. Yeah. And dump truck loads of, of construction material. So when they got caught, there's we had a law in the books that said, you can confiscate the vehicle and they lose it if they're right. found guilty. Right. 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 So... I thought, well, why, why can't you translate that into a into a you know fish and game violation? And why can't uh, you? I don't know. I mean, that's 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 up to lawmakers to you know. I, we only I only enforce the law. I don't make them. So it's up. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, so uh, I I don't know. I I just you know when you see guys get get banged for twenty five thousand dollars for illegal striped bass. Um, they could probably go catch that and and or double that the next time without getting caught. Right. So. Right. You no. Know, so, but if but if they were doing it on a twenty six or a thirty foot boat, and that was you know anywhere from eighty to two hundred thousand dollars, and they lost that, well, you know maybe they think about it. Sure. Sure. Well, it's a good point, man. Maybe we'll change some minds and uh, get some states to adopt that policy if some don't already have it. But, uh, you know, so. We talked a little bit about like sort of the minor common stuff, but uh, I mean, you got a 24 year career in as a ranger. You, you had to have seen some shit, man. So like, without thinking about it too hard, like the, the the one thing that like pops into your head first when people say, you know, tell 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 me a story. What is it? Well, I I would have to say uh, at Washington Crossing Park on you know. I believe it was Thanksgiving. Um, some 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 fellow got mad at at a at a family uh, and got out of the car and shot a fa- killed a father and a grandfather, uh, or for looking at him through the whatever looking at him while they were parked at, at along the river. Ooh, and that's... I was actually just leaving my my uh, tour of duty up at Bulls Island and coming home when I ran into it because uh, that's my travel route was twenty nine to come home. And um, though I was off duty, you know, I, I, I got involved on the periphery of it. So um, then I, you know, I got there and it was, a, it was just a horrible thing. I mean, there was, there was a family that came out after dinner to, to go down the river and look at the river. And, and there was a, a maniac that sat there in a the car next to him and didn't like the way that they were looking at him. Wow, man. That was, that was way heavier than I was expecting. That's holy shit. Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and, the, and of course I knew the, the two rangers that were working that that day, and I had just, again, half an hour before, had been in conversation with them because I was on my way from south along the canal, heading back to uh, you know to, to to check out for the for the evening. So they were thrown into it right away. Of course, Hopewell Township Police and and the guy that did it turned himself in. He drove right to the police station and turned himself in. But you know the aftermath is still laying there on the you know out on the the park property. Sure, yeah. sure. So so um, you know for you know the the human part of the job that was that was the worst thing that I, I mean, and, and and there was a lot of other situations that involved you know, unfortunate death and whatever sure, that I, sure. but that was, uh, that was striking because, you know, I was like, well, you know, I was 20 minutes away from being right there involved with it. Right. And, of and course. where would it have progressed, you know, and I don't know, you know, and, you know, nowadays we know what's going on. People were just nuts and they do that with the crowds. Um, so, uh, 
I don't know. That just, I, uh, you know, it hit me because I was, it hit me harder because I was there and then I wasn't there. You know what I mean? I wasn't sure. there for this. But I'm coming back and, and I'm going, oh my gosh, you know, when I found out exactly what went down. But, uh, you know, to see that. Sure. And, you know, but, you know, I, I, you, you get hardened to, to things because I dealt with many drownings right. and notify, notifying mothers and fathers and whatever. Uh, you know, I've had, you know, had, I mean, you know, a park, let me tell you, a park was like, on a weekend especially, because that's when you're busiest, is like the people leave their houses, say mostly city city folks. Right, right. You know, and... They they just disregard you know there's no laws rules or regulations they just you know they just feel hey I got eight hours to do whatever I want right and, right and and that's so how you had to deal with that you know right. so uh, mostly you had to educate them you know it, 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 whether it got down to summonses or arresting uh, but if you could work it out another way that was fine too you know but. Um, Anything that you can think of that happens in a community happened in a park community. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah uh, well, I mean, so I got I to gotta tell you, you really caught me off guard with the shooting story. I thought we were going to go for, like, you know, people banging in the woods or something. But that's that's uh, much <laughs> – which I'm sure we could probably yeah. go there too, right? Like many different ways. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll save that for a second. But, I mean, I think the the important thing here is that – you know, guys see conservation officers in the field and rangers in the field, and, and you look at them as sort of the guys who uphold fish and game laws, and you don't really think about, like you said, I mean, dealing with people drowning in the river. Um, you know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, there, in, in, in other words, there, there are much worse things that you have to deal with than a guy keeping a couple of extra trout. Although, I have to, I have to imagine that there's, there's some things you've seen, you know, more directly correlating to the fishing scene that, like, at least left you shaking your head. Yeah, I mean, you know, just, just, you know, just the stupid things people would do, you know, is, uh, you know, a new boat owner. And the Delaware River that does nothing and puts his boat in, puts his family in a boat, and he, and he runs up the river at 100 miles an hour, you know, and crashes into a rock. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. When I say that, I just got done telling a guy this. <laughs> right. You know, and, and you know, next thing I know, um, they're okay. Everybody's okay in this an incident like I'm talking about. And... They get back to the, you know, to the ramp, and the guy's got no lower unit on it, brand new motor that he just picked up, uh, you know, three hours before. Sure. On his boat. Sure. And uh, you know, just um, I, I would say non-thinking people just don't think they uh, they get out away. They're they're out for enjoyment, and they lose common sense. Right. Right. Well, so, I mean, well, that that losing common sense stands the test of time. It's funny you bring that up about guys running the boats. I mean, a few years ago, I, I was pulling out on the river down here at this makeshift ramp. It's not a state ramp. It's basically just you know a a, 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 a hole you know in, in the embankment where you can kind of sneak a little boat in. And I, it's during striper season here, and I'm I'm pulling out a raft at ten o'clock at night, and this dude's backing down a twenty two foot fiberglass center console and these guys are trying so hard to figure out how to get it far back enough to float and i pulled out and i was like dude you realize that there is one foot of water for at least 200 yards out into the river and just boulders strewn everywhere and uh the guy's like oh thanks you know we're from philly we heard there was some stripers up here so we were gonna come in and try it i'm like not here dude like you like so I, I I see it every once in a while, but I mean you you saw it a lot more. Um, yeah, I you know, uh, and again, Bulls Island was was my um, place, my headquarters along for along the river and 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 the canal was to was, uh, so I had a campground there also. So right, um, you know, I dealt with you know five hundred people every weekend became its own little city and and you know uh summertime you got 
You know, it's all water. I mean, we're, people are going to the river. You know, they're going to the river. They're going to tube. They're going to float down in life jackets and the jet skiers and the the, the whatever. You know, it's right. just a mishmash. And you know, and I'm I'm one guy standing on the bank looking at this, going, "Oh my God, what do I got today?" <laughs> and you know, and it. I mean, every I can tell you every weekend in the summer. At that spot, there's some type of incident, whether it be jet skiers run into jet skiers, run into tubers, run into people walking out on a wing dam, uh, you know, people, you know, young kids drowning. It was, was, uh, so every week then you're prepared for that. Sure, sure. Well, I... I And and when most people don't see that, right, they go, ah, you go to the park, you have a good time, you relax. Um... No, I, I didn't relax. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so I have to bring up a, a story that my dad told me that you told him, and he said, yeah. I, I have to ask about it. Uh, sure. It's something along the lines of you busting uh, a couple of uh, Chinese guys who were harvesting just loads of freshwater snails that they were then oh. going to take somewhere particular. I'll let you tell. Right. All right. So this happened on <clears throat> the Millstone River um, at uh, Kingston. Okay. Oh, so uh, um, patrolling, which, you know, uh, when I was on that side of the park, I had uh, 20, 30 miles of, of uh, area to cover. Sure. And... So Kingston was, uh, you know, a part, it was a spot with a big parking lot, and you had the canal, and you had Carnegie Lake, and the Millstone River r- ran in and out of it. But at this spot, it, 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 it ran out of it. So it, it was coming over the, the, the falls on Carnegie Lake, the north end. And I pull in, and, you know, this guy's fishing, and, and one guy just says, you know, a guy regular, said, hey, what are you going to do about them people? <laughs> and I go, and I go, he goes, there's other people out there. So I look, and in the Millstone River, for whatever reason, because I'm not a, I'm not a biologist, there were the stargazer snails. You, you, you know what they are. I know, they, I've heard know, of the, them. Yeah. Well, the little eye in the middle. You know, the shell goes around, and you got the little looks like an eye in the middle. So we, yeah. we call them stars. And they're probably, uh, you know, a good inch and a half to two and a half inches across. They're, they're big, and in a white van is a couple five gallon buckets. The side door is open, and these and here's three people: two two uh, two older men and a younger girl. And they're picking these snails, and they're I mean they got bucket loads of them, right? And I go, "What's going on here?" You know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I go down and I and I and I and I call them over, and <clears throat> nobody's going to speak English. So I'm having a real hard time figuring out what to do here because, you know, so, so finally I asked the young girl, I said, do you speak English? And she says, yes. So that was good. So <laughs> I asked her what, you know, what are you, what are they doing with this? And she, and so she told me, she said, well, um, they, we take them and we sell them, uh, to the Chinese community restaurants in New York. Mm. And. You know, and they sell, and they sell them, the meat, and as a sidebar, (laughs) uh, she explains that they sell the shells, they grind them up, and they, they, you know, in her terms, it comes out that they're an aphrodisiac. No So they make money off shells, too, by by people ingesting the, 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 the powdered shells. Now, I never tried it, so I'm not going to tell you whether that. <laughs> you didn't sit a couple well, anyhow, in your pocket, I'm man? Come dilemma. on. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in a dilemma. I got Now, I'm looking. I got two. They come out of the water with two five-gallon pails that are almost full. And I think there was three more in a truck, right? And I go, well, I don't know of any state law that says you, you can't collect these things. Right. So, but... They must be there for a reason, and I can't see 1,500 to 2,000 of these things being taken away. So I call Fish and Game, figuring they know something. 
and I did get a, uh, the Mercer County uh, fellow who wasn't too far away, luckily for me. Right. And so I kept people busy for 15 minutes. He arrived, and in discussing with him, he goes, I, you know, I have no idea. I, what, uh, fresh water, he goes, but, you know, they're shellfish. <laughs> yeah. And so, so shellfish has a license, which is salt water, but says that you can only collect 150 clams, you know. Right, right. So... So we decide to invoke that. Ah, okay. And I not told them that, and they got away with no summonses because they went back in the water. End of story. They they went back in the water, but we we threatened them with uh, 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 you know they were clamming taking shellfish without a license. Okay, so they had to get a license to collect shellfish, and then we worried about that later because we weren't sure how that was going to go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we convinced them to throw them, you know, convinced them to throw them back in into the uh, into the Millstone River. But you know, the mere fact that you know, it was a business, and there was a side to it. When when the girl explained to me that they you know that they sold the meat to the to the uh, Chinese restaurants and then the shells to somebody else. Who ground them for powder, and they were used for what I. Well, <laughs> so all right, so that that's a lot of snails, right? But any oh, other yeah, that's, that's <laughs> lucrative business. <laughs> <laughs> have you they, did, did you ever have any other busts that were a little more tied to poaching like that, where you know it was a bigger deal than one or two extra trout? Uh, you know, I helped out fish and game on a few things. Um, before baiting for deer was allowed, right? You know, before it was allowed. Now, you know, now you can you can bait deer. But prior to uh, the years prior to where baiting wasn't allowed, um, yeah, had had some North Jersey crew that was in Hunterdon County that were um, baiting animals, and they were actually sh- ride by shooting them. They they would bait edges of fields and then ride by at night put the light on them and shooting them of course they were shooting them with rifles right right and um the way we caught them was their method was they would shoot and throw a rag out on the side of the road gotcha right and to come back later and so um you know, I spent a couple kept a couple nights working with them, and 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 actually, um, you know, it turned out that it was it, it was a, a ring of guys. I think there was seven involved, and um, you know, they were selling the meat to um, restaurants who were selling it illegally. Now, now you got to remember that 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 for me that was when there's a little bit of uneasiness with your job is. You're dealing with somebody that has a weapon. Sure, sure. Right. So, so fishing is ah, uh, you know, guys got a fishing pole, but yeah, he's gonna whip you with an ugly stick or something. <laughs> hey, hunting season, you're, uh, everybody you're encountering has a gun. So, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think, as far as I know, that you're, uh, you, you're much of a social media guy, though. I, I am curious, like uh, maybe if you have some insight in this. You know, we we're talking about back in the day when, you know, all you could do is make a phone call. Nobody had a cell phone. Nobody had the ability to shoot video on the spot and all this stuff. I mean, I've I've covered a fair amount of, of news stories and things that, you know, revolved around people getting nailed because they stupidly put their wrongdoing out there for the public. And, I mean, it, it happens, you know – all the time. Um, I mean, do you really think that like these days is, is part of the job, uh, you know, sort of combing Instagram and Facebook? I mean, is that sort of uh, worked its way, you know, into the, the policing of, of fish and game law? Oh, yeah. A lot, long, long time ago, especially fish and game. Not so much in my, my job, uh, you know, p- parks, but fish and game had. Why I was still working, so I'm retired 24 years. Right. So while I was still working, I knew fish and game officers uh, that dealt with uh, illegal imports of exotic, you know, game. Right. And species, you know, it could have been snakes, parrots, whatever. Right. And really, the most of the way they found out is because 
social media was just starting, and that's where people were advertising. Right. So, so they um, they got into that. That's you know there was two or three guys, maybe one in South Jersey, one in Central, and one in North Jersey that they, besides doing you know ha- having to maybe patrol their county, they were also charged with that, and they were um, you know they would put in their eight hours and then go home and put in five hours and on a computer and look at what they could find and then, you know, get into the investigation of that. So I can only imagine, you know, people are stupid, how much that's exploded today. You know, people just love to brag about what they do. That's, sure. that's the big. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. That, and that's exactly the best way to put it is just, just people love to brag about what they do. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. So I, I, you know, like I said, I knew that was happening 25, 26 years ago with, you know, exotic animals and, and reptiles and whatever coming into the country. And um, so can you imagine, you know, you can under, you know what it was like 25 years ago. I mean, you know, people were just, were taking hours to figure out how to get onto a computer. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, uh, you know, it's any, any, any electronic device that you can, work they're they're on it they're putting their their information out there sure. and and you know in in the instance for law enforcement it probably makes it so much easier yeah i was going to say well that well that tool probably swings both ways i mean people are idiots because they have to brag but also i mean a lot of people get busted now because everybody's got a cameraman i mean i know i know several people that have posted videos of them filming people blatantly doing illegal shit like in broad daylight you know yeah, uh, yeah, and you're right, and and that's why when we go fishing, no, no, no cell phones allowed on my boat. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We should go fishing. We've actually never gone fishing. We should go striper fishing. I just invited myself out on your boat. So, well, good. We'll see what happens if they allow us to striper fish this year or not. I don't know. I'm waiting, waiting to. See the outcome on that. I know that's uh, a that's a whole big debate and a whole can of worms. Though you know, I I do have one question just because I'm, I'm dying to know. Right, so um, I, I <laughs> were you lenient when you caught people making sweet sweet love in the woods at state parks? Very. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm a product of the '60s, like your father. You know, which was peace peace love naked Woodstock. So. <laughs> You know, my, my wife always left me with that thought. She goes, how are you going to bust people for doing stuff like that? And I went, well, I'm not. <laughs> but I'm going to take a little extra time in questioning them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did it throw anybody else off when Ron told the story about the father and the grandfather getting murdered in the park? on Thanksgiving Day uh, in front of their family because <laughs> uh, if you didn't notice it from the recording, that is that is not a story I was expecting him to tell. And it speaks to a point that I made in the beginning of this about a lot of people thinking about um, conservation officers and park rangers as just the dude making sure that uh, nobody's keeping, um, you know, too many catfish or whatever it may be, short flounder, okay? And in in a sense, um, <laughs> I said that and then fell right into that trap in, in recording this, you know? Uh, Ron's a funny guy. He's, he's a ball buster like me. So, you know, when I posed that question of, like, you know, what's the craziest thing that ever happened, man? You know, I'm thinking about some, you know, ridiculous story tied to a guy, you know, not having a license, and he he throws that one out there. So what does that mean? Well, you know, I have seen, as I'm sure you have too, um, a fair amount of, of people complaining on the socials, because that's what it was invented for, was to complain, um, you know, about uh, fishing game officers, conservation officers, rangers, whoever it may be, you know, um, not busting people for fishing violations. You know, I see these guys down there all the time, you know, I, I, 
nobody's ever down there, nobody's ever going down there to check, and nobody's ever down there busting them, and da-da-da, as if, like, these guys are just, you know, sitting in an office somewhere playing uh, Minesweeper, okay? Um, first of all, did you call? Because I think one of the most important takeaways uh, from talking to Ron is that um, you need to, even if you don't think it's going to equate to anything, you have to. Because while there's a strong possibility, thanks just to lack of, of general manpower, um, there's, you know, there's a strong possibility that you're not going to see any instant gratification from that, Okay. But you're not going to see any gratification or there will be no justice, whether it's a ticket or a court case, if you don't make the call. Now, I do think that it's it's fair to point out, all right, that, um, you know, Ron is only speaking to the way things work uh, as a ranger here, okay, in New Jersey. And, you know, different states, you know, some of them are not quite as uh, undermanned. I mean, Florida comes to mind. I mean, you know. FWC, man, they, they got um, some more manpower out there than uh, a lot of states do. So this is not a generalization. We're just sort of only speaking uh, to Jersey. But I think there are a lot of states that have that issue. I mean, there's just not that many officers per county or per park. Um, and, and they just can't see everything. But I think the more important message uh, based on that horror story, right, is that when you do see – Somebody doing something dumb, you know, killing fish that are too small or putting every living thing they find in a bucket or throwing a cast net or whatever it is. And you call and you don't get that instant gratification. OK, consider that there is the possibility, right, that the dude who would handle that for you could be on the phone with a mother telling her that he just pulled her drowned kid uh, out of the river, you know. They have to deal with that, too. Like, <laughs> we all love to watch and post videos of people being complete asshats at boat ramps, you know, where the, the boat and then the entire um, Subaru Forester that was pulling the 34-foot contender ends up underwater at the ramp. And we laugh and we shake our heads, but whoever shot the video uh, goes about his day. Uh, and the entire rest of that day, in many cases, is going to uh, be eaten up with that nonsensory by maybe the one ranger in that county park or the one ranger in that state park or the closest uh, fish and game officer. You know, so that's what I mean. There, there's a lot, a lot, a lot more to that job than, you know, busting guys in the uh, the White Bucket Brigade. Call it like it is, you know? And, you know, one thing that, that Ron and I talked about, we didn't include it in the pod, but we sort of talked as we were as we were hanging up, that I thought was interesting uh, was he, he was saying how much his job has changed since he left it, you know? Um, in, in a nutshell, nowadays on the, the park ranger front, um, it's it's strictly, as he puts it, a law enforcement role, okay? Whereas when he was a park ranger, he says, you know, not to make it sound corny, but it was like being a Disney park ranger or like, you know, Mr. Ranger from Yogi Bear. You know, you were a friendly face at the park that you worked at. You were there every day. And your job for the day might be taking a bunch of kids on a nature walk and teaching them about turtles, and teaching them about snakes and stuff like that. You know, it was, uh, it, there was a lot going on that made it a lot more personable. You know what I mean? And nowadays, uh, you know, with the, with the younger crew and, and the next generation, and because of some politics and, and the way just, just things have, have changed, um, you know, they don't really do that anymore. Unfortunately, a lot of the younger guys that, that have a ranger role or, or maybe even a CO role, um, they just want to be treated more like a cop, you know what I mean? And they're more interested in just busting people and writing tickets and upholding the law. But, you know, Ron says then you sort of you sort of lose that Mr. Ranger um, kind of vibe. You know, he, he very much uh, took a lot of pride in, in being sort of a steward of the outdoors for uh, all types of people, whether they hunted or fished or not, or they just liked hiking. 
you know, within the parks that he worked at and and around here, at least, um, that's gone away. You know, and, and I even see that now on the occasion, if I'm being completely honest, you know. I remember being a kid and hanging out in state parks, county parks, with, with my grandfather and my dad. And, you know, you'd bump into a ranger driving around in his white truck, and he'd pull over and talk and, you know, ask little me what I was catching and if I was having fun and blah, 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 blah. Nowadays, you know, you, you see uh, sort of the, the, the new school of younger guys, conservation officers and stuff. Um, you know, they're like uh, they're like a SWAT team, man. You know, it's it's a different... Vibe, and I had mentioned my buddy AJ Matola, who is is one of these guys, and um, I, I I bumped into him this summer and some of his colleagues because they were actually ramping up um, and cracking down on tube launching, among other things, at some of the local state ramps here on the river. Like if it's a state funded and maintained ramp, you are not supposed to come down there with floaty orca whales and inflatable alligators and tubes that you bought an hour ago at Walmart and used the ramp to put them in, okay? You could say, ah, come on, okay? And you know what? Maybe. But, like, <laughs> it's the rule. There's signs everywhere. So um, those guys were, were out there, and um, they're, they're an intimidating force, man. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's not the, the Ranger Rick deal, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, little more, a little more tactical, you know what I mean? Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. I'm just calling it like I see it, you know? So I had said in the beginning of this that I had a story about the first time that I met AJ, uh, which I will close with because it was just like a, one of those things that was like, oh, my God, like I cannot believe this right now. So, you know, uh, opening day trout season in Jersey and PA are both in uh, April. And uh, as a lot of you know, I live right across the border from Jersey now. Technically, I live in Pennsylvania. Not technically. I mean, I live in Pennsylvania. But, like, I could still spit on Jersey almost. So I still consider myself a Jersey boy through and through. But in any case, the way I understand uh, the way that they stock trout in PA is uh, they're going to stock them at some point in March for the April opener. But um, since they don't know exactly when they'll get to each body of water, Any trout stock body of water closes March 1 until opening day. And uh, we have a canal similar to the one that that Ron was talking about on the Jersey side over here on the Pennsylvania side. And any parking spot along that canal as of March 1 is plastered with signs that you cannot miss that say no fishing March 1 to opening day. This is trout stocked water. Okay. Well, the thing is, though, a lot of the parking lots for this canal are the best places to park to access uh, some pieces of shoreline on the Delaware River, right? So I go down there, like, second week of March, something like that, just this past year, and I park along the canal, and there's there's nobody in the lot. A huge lot, completely empty, just my truck, and uh, I grab all my stuff, and I'm going to go down to this little wintering hole, Um, in the Delaware. So I go down there and I fish and it was terrible and it was a terrible day. And here I come walking up the road back to the parking lot along the canal. And I've got waders on and I've got a chest pack on and I've got three rods. And uh, to just sort of seal the deal, I also have the classic Flow Troll um, yellow and white minnow bucket in my other hand. Okay. So I, I come up the road, I crest this little hill walk over the canal bridge, bang a left into the parking lot, and I am still the only truck there. So I, I literally, I like, I get the tailgate down. That's as far as I got when what pulls in behind me but a gigantic stocking truck, okay, a, a whole school bus full of children from a local school that are going to help stock. And I think... um every CO in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Like, no bullshit. Like, they just came streaming in like a caravan. Just conservation officer, squad vehicle, one after another, after another, after another. And there's me standing there in in full wading gear next to a sign that says no fishing with three f***ing rods and a minnow bucket. my life. And I was just like, 
oh, man, please don't sound all nervous and jittery, you know. And sure enough, one of those CO trucks opens up, out jumps dude, hands on his hips, right? Walks right up to me, looks me dead in the face, and he goes, you want to shoot a hook shots of a stock in these trout? <laughs> And it was AJ, and he knew who I was, and I was like, uh, maybe. He's like, don't worry, man. I know you were down at the river. And I was like, oh, my God. Thank God. Oh, sweet God. Here, have some hookshot stickers, man. Uh, it was just like complete, like, holy shit. Thank God. And, <laughs> and that was the first time I ever officially in person uh, met my boy AJ. Listen, treat fish and game violations uh, like they want you to at the airport and the train station these days. It's beating into our heads over loudspeakers. If you see something, say something. Have the right phone numbers in your phone for where you live. When I do bump into AJ, he always ends a conversation with, hey, man, you ever see anything, you know how to reach me. And even though these guys might not say that exact thing to everybody, um, I will admit that just, you know, having a line to somebody that I know is going to pay attention or uh, look at the message or whatever pretty quickly, uh, I like that. You know what I mean? Because it does take away that sense of like, hey, even if I see something go down, like nobody's probably going to do anything, so I won't bother. Bother. All right? Do it. And I, I really can't thank uh, Ron enough for taking the time to talk to us today. I hope that... Uh, you know, his story and, and some of the things he had to say gives you sort of a new appreciation for what rangers and fish and game officers and uh, conservation officers do out there in the field. Anyway, I will catch you guys right back here in two weeks. Do us a favor and keep your noses clean. And as always, thanks so much for listening to the Hook Shots podcast. <laughs>